Um, welcome everyone to our virtual outings, Rock Parks, our virtual outing, Rock Parks of Berkeley. I'm Ken Lavin, the outings coordinator for Greenbelt Alliance. And during more normal times, Greenbelt Alliance offers outings nearly every weekend throughout the, somewhere throughout the nine county Bay Area. But like everybody else these days, we're, we're sheltering in place mostly. So we've gone to these offering, uh, hosting these virtual outings. But it does give us a chance to, to reach a, a wider audience and to, to let people know about Greenbelt Alliance and, and some of our work. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jesse Brennan, who's Greenbelt Alliance Director of Marketing and Communications. Thank you, Ken. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Greenbelt Alliance, our mission is to educate, advocate, and collaborate to ensure the Bay Area's lands and communities are resilient to a changing climate. And the work we do to protect the Bay Area's natural and agricultural lands, while also creating thriving communities, as well as this free outings program is made possible by you. And so in the spirit of giving, please donate today if you feel inspired to do so after this outing, which you can do securely on our website at greenbelt.org forward slash donate. Uh, and I hope you all enjoy this outing with our board member, Bob Johnson, and I'll turn it over to you, Bob. Thanks. Thanks very much. And I'm delighted so many people have joined us today. We're almost 200, we're to 98 participants now. I'm, I'm sorry that I can't see you all, but uh, if, if we have a very big group of people, we, we use the webinar format. I've been uh, involved as a volunteer with Green Blind Alliance since 1989 and on the board since 1992. I've uh, been uh, on a number of committees and then in the, num in the 1990s, I got involved in the outings program, leading outings out in the Greenbelt, in Berkeley and in other urban areas. And um, I've also uh, led outings for Berkeley Path Wonders Association, Berkeley Historical Society and Bay Nature. I've led a number of outings with my friend Janet Byron, and about seven years ago, we decided uh, to uh, start making a book out of our outings. And uh, we were able to find a publisher, and five years ago, the book came out called Berkeley Walks that had 18 uh, self-guided walks. And two years ago, we came out with the second edition pictured here that added three more walks and, and made a number of other uh, improvements to the, to the book. Um, I've also done, um, since then, since the book publication, uh, we, had, we had material for more walks. There are 18 more walks which are available for free on our website, www.berkeleywalks.com. Um, they're in a series of three. So there's six sets of three. They're in PDF formats that can be downloaded for free and you could uh, print them out. You could look at them on a a uh, laptop, uh, a tablet device, or, or a smartphone. Um, so uh, we're, we're going to do a walk in Berkeley Walks today. I wanted to say one thing about Greenbelt Alliance. Um, having been involved with the organization so many years, I've been really impressed on how much we have achieved in protecting open space and revitalizing our cities. I think without Greenbelt Alliance, the Bay Area would be a very different place today. And I'm very excited about our new strategic focus on resilience as we face climate change. Uh, a, this is a new angle on protecting open space and revitalizing our cities to look at how we will be resilient against fires, against floods, against ocean level rise, against droughts. And I, I think uh, what the work we're doing is gonna be very exciting for the Bay Area. So today's walk um, is going to be in area of uh, Northeast Berkeley, um, where there are a number of, uh, there are quite a few uh, rock outcrops, uh, mainly of volcanic rhyolite. And uh, I think you'd find few other uh, neighborhoods in the Bay Area that have so many rock, rock outcrops. And certainly the way they have been integrated into the landscape uh, is fairly neat, unique. We will visit uh, seven small parks that focus on these outcrops as well as passing through neighborhoods with striking residences and gardens, um, many including more rocks in people's gardens. There's some steep hill up uphill on sidewalks and paths and stairways. 
Well, here's a map showing our route today for the outing. And you can see we cover quite a lot of ground uh, in the, uh, the, the uh, lower part of uh, the hills up, up into the media, middle part of the hills in Northeast Berkeley. It's actually five miles total uh, with 1100 feet elevation gain, but it's not gonna even raise your pulse rate thanks to the wonders of virtualization. Here's a map that shows a little more detail, just the first part of the walk where we're gonna uh, loop around right at the sort of foot of, of the hills. Um, we're starting at the Northeast corner of Solano Avenue in the Alameda in North Berkeley, which is the top of the Solano um, Avenue com uh, commercial zone. And we'll be heading uh, left, which is actually north. North is to the left on this map, on the Alameda and looping around on this first segment of the walk. Um, later on, we'll be using Indian Rock Path, which comes right down to, to our starting path, starting point. Well, the, the area is actually a mainly, uh, that we'll be walking today, mainly built out in, in two subdivisions uh, by developers, uh, one called North Bry and the other Thousand Oaks, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Well, let's get started. Uh, we're gonna be walking north on the Alameda on the right side of the street. And the street is lined with uh, sycamore trees, also known as uh, London plane trees or platanus. And on the right side, you see uh, stone walls. These actually, here's a better view. Um, they go all along for, for a good ways uh, at uh, the bottom of each lot. Um, and this was put, these were put in by the developer of North Briar, which is Mason McDuffie. Uh, it's kind of an indication of this was the uh, easternmost uh, end of, of their uh, subdivision of North Bry. And I believe this rock is the, the same kind of rhyolite rock that we're gonna be seeing uh, later in the rock outcrops. Well, let's keep going. Eventually at Capistrano Avenue, uh, we come to this uh, very tall sweet gum or liquid ambar tree. Um, unfortunately, I think this tree, probably most of the leaves has fallen now. There are all still some, some sweet gum trees with good autumn colors, but uh, this one, I think they've most fallen. The picture was taken several weeks ago when it was in full color. If we go just a little bit, just beyond Capistrano Avenue, we come to um, a row of paper bark trees, which is Melaleuca linarifolia. Um, these trees here are the paper bark trees. They come from Australia, I believe. And in the summertime, they're covered with uh, all these spikes of white, of uh, small white flowers that it, it, it makes them look like the broccoli dipped in cream, whipped cream. It's, it's quite impressive. Um, they get their name, if you look at the inset here, um, they have very peely, spongy bark, and that's where they get the common name of uh, paper bark. Well, we start to go uphill a little bit and then come to this cement urn at the Indian Trail. Okay, the Indian Trail is different from the Indian rock path that was at the beginning of our walk. And as I mentioned, uh, there were two developers. This area was developed by John Hopkins Spring, and it was called Thousand Oaks. Um, and uh, as part of that development, they put these, these urns in. Um, the area uh, got developed just after 1908. In 1908, there was a, a statewide uh, ballot measure uh, in the election to uh, move the state capital from Sacramento to Berkeley. Uh, well, as you probably could guess, it lost, um, except for the Bay Area. Most of the rest of the state didn't want the capital in the Bay Area, which they thought was too, too powerful. So uh, there was also on the same ballot measure, a Berkeley uh, ballot measure to create a park of a thousand acres in this area. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it, while it got the majority, it didn't quite get the two thirds majority. So, so the area got developed in, in a fairly upscale uh, development. And uh, as I say, Thousand Oaks was in this area and um, these urns were put in um, as a way of giving some distinction to the area. Um, there's a number of impressive houses. This is one just uphill from, from where we are now um, that was uh, designed by architect Henry Gutterson. Um, and the house is uh, from 1917 in, in Georgian style. Well, when they laid out the, the area, uh, they basically put the streets along the contours. Um, they left most of the route outcrops and as many as they could of the, 
plentiful live oaks. Um, and they also put in various paths and stairways. So this one called Indian Trail, um, instead of a cement steps, they put in uh, large, they put in large rocks to make the pathway going up. And uh, it's, some of the steps are pretty big, but it's kind of a fun trail to go up as long as you watch your step. When you get to the top and just cr across Yosemite Road is our first rock park. And this is called uh, Great Stone Face Park. It was don donated by the developer, uh, John Hopkins Spring, to the city in 1921. Now, the feature that gives the park its name of Great Stone Face, I've never been able to find it. Maybe it's hidden by foliage. There's a number of rock outcrops, or, or maybe it's changed uh, due to erosion. Um, in any case, it's a nice little park. Um, it's only um, a, a, a small part of an acre, uh, but it has a grassy play area and then these rock outcrops. Now you'll see another urn there. Um, the first urn we saw in the previous picture is the only one of the original, uh, about 20 urns left. But recently the, neighbor, the Neighborhood Association recreated uh, a few of the urns, including uh, this one right here. Um, now, did, how, did, how did these rhyolite outcrops get here? Um, Ken, Ken can maybe correct me if I, I, I get something wrong on the geology here, but going back something like 25, 29 million years ago, as the Pacific plate dived under the continental plate, it began, began creating California. And the two crates, plates scraping together created a melange of, of, of very diverse rocks. Also created a lot of heat and pressure that caused earthquakes and volcanoes to further transform the geology. Now the rhyolite supposedly that's here dates back something like eight, 12 million years ago and uh, was formed by surface eruptions that flowed very slowly compared to the kind of black lava we see in places like Hawaii. Uh, some geologists believe that the volcano that formed them was near what's now Hollister and the rocks got, have been carried here uh, by the plate movements of the, uh, of the Hayward Fault and so on. Um, while the, the Bay Area has been transformed since Native American times, most of these rock outcrops would still look very familiar to the early in, inhabitants from a few thousand years ago. Um, and the rhyolite was often quarried uh, along with other types of rock uh, by the Native Americans and, and also quarried some in some places in recent times. So they could use the rocks for rocks, for, for tools and charms, uh, for grinding acorns, for cooking, um, and in modern times for, for retaining walls and the lock, like. A little closer examination of uh, the surface of the rock shows the gray uh, spots there are lichen. There's also reddish, which is iron oxide. And then there's yellowish, which is limonite. That's another uh, iron oxide. Sometimes in the rock, you can see what are called flow bands, which has to do with the particular way that the, the rocks flowed and cooled. In this case, the flow bands here seem to be running almost vertically. And that's because uh, the rocks of subsequent upheaval to when, when they first formed. Now we cross back over Yosemite Road and we go down uh, a bit to the right along the sidewalk. There are several big impressive homes with large lots that we've uh, passed. And particularly this one is uh, quite impressive. Um, this house is at 1864 Yosemite Road and it's in the Swiss Chalet style. Um, it's from 1913. It's set up against a, a large rock outcrop and there's supposedly a cave on the property that has um, some things that indicate the previous Native American pres presence. Now the house was the home of Mark Daniels, a famous civil engineer and landscape architect. He was a landscape engineer and superintendent for Yosemite National Park and a landscape engineer for the National Park Service overall. For the private sector, he designed Forest Hills and Seacliff neighborhoods in San Francisco, Bel Air in Southern California, and he laid out Monterey 17 mile drive. He also laid out this area of Thousand Oaks for John Hopkins Spring and with the idea that it would be in harmony with nature. Um, and he reportedly designed this house, his own house together with Oakland architect, A.W. Smith. Well, we will proceed down Yosemite Road, noting other homes and gardens and turn left on the Alameda. And uh, this is the streets is a very different character here from the wide street near Solano Avenue where we started. 
um, and we come across this big rod, uh, uh, rock outcrop that's in the side yard of someone's home. Um, there's actually a, it's called the guardian or sentinel rock. And there's actually, you can't see it too clearly in this photo, but there's a cleft here with a little path through it. Uh, unfortunately, that's on private land. So we're just going to look from here from, from the public sidewalk. Um, the house itself um, is uh, somewhat hidden from this angle behind the rock, but from the street, a little farther along, we can see the house and it's called Villa Felice, um, which means uh, happy villa in Italian. And it's in Italian Renaissance revival style, um, which uh, indicated by the um, all of the arches. And then there's this beautiful wrought iron uh, on the uh, at the porch level. It also comes down the uh, railing along the stairway, which we can't see too well from from this uh, with, with the shrub in front of it. Just across the street from that um, is this beautiful tree, uh, which is called the red flowering gum tree. This is another Australian tree. Um, it's the, uh, the proper name is, uh, is Corymbia uh, fichifolia. Um, it, it's not in flower right now, but it was when I took this picture and quite amazing. So from the, having crossed to see that tree and going just a little bit to the left, we can then turn right down El Paseo path one of the many paths in the area. Um, and again, they've used rocks here, partly in the path. There's also some rock steps further, further along and also lining the path. Um, we go down the path to Santa Rosa Avenue. We cross that and we go uh, one more block down a little bit steeper to Vincente Avenue. We go left on Vincente and we come to this house uh, right away at 683 Vincente that's built up on a rise with a big route outcrop that comes right down to the sidewalk and actually takes away part of the sidewalk. Sidewalk's kind of narrow here. Um, it's an interesting place. Right down here in this, in the right-hand corner, there's actually a mailbox that was cut into the rock. Um, there is a very lovely uh, wrought iron kind of Art Nouveau railing uh, along the stairway. Um, there is this uh, light fixture that's actually like a little height ladder. So it's seen better here on the, the left, uh, lower left insert. Um, and at the top, there is a light fixture that comes up and hangs over the top of the stairway. It has uh, lovely glass on it. But probably you could also call it an Art Nouveau uh, style. Now I understand from one thing I read and also from what a neighbor told me one time that a family living here before, the kids uh, coming home from school did not use the star stairway. Um, they clambered up the rock to get back to the house. Well, we're going to continue. Uh, we're going to actually turn around and go back. So we're heading north on Vincente Avenue and we come to 616. We pass a bunch of uh, houses in Craftsman and other styles, but we come to 616 Vincente, um, which has a, um, a deck that's built on top of a rock outcrop in their yard. And uh, this rock, I think, is called uh, Tamil Pious Rock. Um, and uh, they have, you can see out here that they have, they have a tremendous view uh, out over the bay as the house faces basically west. Just across the street from that, um, at 619 um, Vincente Avenue is a contemporary house from around 1950, which is built out uh, over another big rock. Um, that actually takes up a good part of what would be the basement, the garage and, and basement, which is here. I've, I've seen it when the garage door is open and it, it's just amazing that this, there's this big rock uh, inside. Um, the, I think the, the rock that they used uh, to, on the siding and um, retaining wall and steps is, is, uh, is from as a different kind of this orangish rock from, from Arizona. And apparently the guy who built the house was a kind of engineer and he had to divert a, an underground stream in order to put his house here. Maybe partly why this was one of the later houses to be built along the street. Well, just a little bit farther along, we come to Thousand Oaks Boulevard. We turn right, go uphill on Thousand Oaks, uh, Oaks Boulevard a little ways, and then turn left on Mendel Place. And right around, right, right, right away on the left side, um, is another big rock in someone's yard. And you can see it's practically hiding the house um, that's behind it with its tile roof and columns. And growing basically out of the rock um, is this great big uh, Deodor cedar tree. Well, we continue a little bit along Menlo Place as it curves around. Um, and then we turn right on uh, 
Santa Rosa Avenue, I believe is the street. Yes. Um, and uh, at that point, there is a big rock that again is on private land. This is called Picnic Rock. And it is a city of Berkeley designated landmark. Um, I was on the Berkeley Landmark Commission for eight years and you can, uh, you generally landmark structures of various kinds, but you can landmark other features. And also, for example, they have landmarked what they believe is the site, what is the remains underground of uh, a, a large uh, Indian uh, burial shell mound, um, a, a shell mound that was also used for burials um, near, uh, near the bay at, uh, and near Strawberry Creek. Oh, that um, I wanted to mention also, this is on private land. Uh, it got fenced off because of liability issues, um, but the owner will uh, allow people to visit the rock uh, with permission. And when I was leading a walk, uh, an, a real walk, um, the owner was there, he lives across the street and said, would you like to see it? And he unlocked the gate and let us climb up on the rock, which was good fun, it was something we hadn't been expecting. So we go a little bit further, we turn left up Thousand Oaks, Boulevard and on the left side in 1871 um, is this house that really has a very colorful succulent garden. I, I uh, really enjoy the textures and colors of it. We continue going up uh, past a couple more uh, intersecting streets on Thousand Oaks till we get to 1937 Thousand Oaks and set back a mix uh, oak trees and more rock outcrops is this 1937 Thousand Oaks house. It's uh, it's a 1913, uh, I'm sorry, 1915 house designed by Julia Morgan, the famous architect who did the Hearst Castle and um, a Sillimore Conference Center and many, uh, many homes and other uh, buildings in, in Berkeley and, and around the Bay Area. Um, and it looks like this rock is <laughs> blocking the front door. It is right in front of the front door here, but um, you, you, can, you can get to the front door. One of the interesting things is the house has a lot of angles like here and here and so on. And supposedly inside, there is no room that has all four corners at 90 degrees. The house was built for uh, the, the daughter of a congressman and, and her husband. Just across the street from that is this house at 1936,000 Oaks. Designed by thousand, the job designed by John Hudson Thomas, who was a very prolific um, residential architect in Berkeley and the Bay Area. Um, he's one one of my favorite architects, along with Maybeck, uh, Julie Morgan, and some others. Um, this house it doesn't look quite so impressive. This side we'll see the other side, which is rather interesting in a moment. Um, we're going to go back down to, towards the right on Thousand Oaks Boulevard now, and we come to Great Stone Face Park again which we had visited earlier. And we're gonna take this path downward. It's right along the so one side of Thousand Oaks Park uh, with the fence for the private property on the left. And the, the house, um, which we didn't picture, but it has kind of Japanese style to it. And when we get down to the bottom where there's some steps, we can peek over the fence and see the garden, which is a fairly large, impressive garden that has a number of Japanese features, including some lanterns, this little bridge-like thing here, some rock outcrops, Japanese maples, uh, and so on. I think this pile of rocks here is probably something that was just there temporarily for some construction they're planning. Well, we're now down uh, at Yosemite Road again, so we're going to cross that carefully because there's a, a blind curve and we have to listen for cars as well as watching out for them. When we get to the other side, we're kind of going to look back to the house next to this. And this is the rear of that John Hudson Thomas house we saw earlier. Um, because it's on, on a downhill slope, um, it's even more impressive on this side with a big entryway, arched entryway, the iron gate, and a, a kind of uh, st uh, wooden structure on that's part of the house on, on the top. Um, I understand there's actually a hall in the house that has been used for, uh, for concerts. Well, we're going to continue walking now for a ways. Um, we're on uh, Yosemite Road, so we're going to continue on Yosemite Road, heading away from Great Stone Face Park. We go around a curve, um, and then going off to the left is Yosemite Road, but we're going to keep straight, which it actually now becomes Contra Costa Avenue. Uh, we're going to cross Capistrano, that we, where we earlier saw lower down the, uh, that big uh, sweet gum tree. Um, and eventually we come on both sides of the road, there's a ravine of Blackberry Creek. 
uh, which is a, a seasonal creek. If I guess if there's a lot of rain, it may have some flow in the summer. It was dry when I took this picture. It's it's down in the, in the ravine here. Um, it flows uh, into Cerrito Creek down near Albany Hill. Um, some years ago, uh, the people at this at this side of of the road uh, put in a lot more native trees, and it's really quite lush now with various native trees and shrubs. Um, it'll be even more fun when if we get enough rain that the water starts flowing. Just next to that, 841 Contra Costa Avenue is this very interesting home from, um, I think it's from the 1960s, um, that um, to me remind, I lived in Japan for many years, and it kind of reminds me of a Japanese temple with this uh, big steep roof and with the eaves that come out so far that makes a kind of very dark shadow underneath. Uh, 1968 is when the house is from. Now, just across the street and a little farther along is this very large uh, oak tree. It's a native coastal, uh, California coastal live oak. Um, and it almost looks as though the, uh, the trunk uh, went away somewhere and, and instead it developed these huge branches. So I, I've just dubbed it the Hercules oak because it, it looks like, you know, this, these huge branches are holding up the world or something. It's probably, from its size, it's probably one of the oldest oaks in, in Berkeley. Well, we continue along Contra Costa Avenue and we come to our second rock park, which is Contra Costa Rock Park. Um, this one comes uh, also right down to, to the sidewalk. And there are some steps going up on this side. If we go up those steps, oh, this one was uh, donated by uh, Mason McDuffie, which did the North Bride development um, in 1917. It's, uh, it's just about, uh, a half an acre in size. Or no, it's actually, it's even less than that. It's about a sixth of an acre. And if we go up the steps to this point, there are steps cut into the rock, which lead up towards the top. We have to be careful at the top because there's kind of a steep drop off on this side. Um, but we do get some view from the top out over the rooftops towards uh, the, uh, the, the bay. And there's, uh, there's San Francisco with the Salesforce Tower sticking up over there. Um, Golden Gate Bridge is just barely visible here, and this is Marin here. Uh, or no, maybe this is this is probably Angel Island and Marin. Um, and uh, so th this is one one of the popular rocks to go to for for enjoying the view. If we go, if we kind of turn around, uh, it's a little hard to see in this photo, but these are actually more steps cut into the rock, which go down the backside. Uh, of the rock to a little bit of park, and we can actually go around uh, and come out uh, the other side of the rock outcrop back to the uh, back to uh, Contra Costa Avenue. So let's see where where we are now. So um, so this is another segment of the map. We'd we'd come here on Contra Costa Avenue, and there's Contra Costa Co Park. We've just left the park. We're going to go left a little bit. Um, we get to Indian Rock Path, and we're going to go up Indian Rock Path. Here's the path. Uh, generally, there's only a few steps on the path. Generally, it just uh, is a paved path that, that slants upward uh, from, from the top of Solano Avenue all the way to Indian Rock, several blocks. And it's probably, if not the most popular, it's probably one of the most popular uh, paths in Berkeley um, as it connects Indian Rock and the neighborhood all around there, uh, down to the Solano Avenue Business District. Well, we go up the path, we cross Mendocino Avenue, which doesn't have much traffic. Uh, we cross uh, Arlington, which has a pretty fair amount of traffic and it goes pretty fast. But fortunately, there's a median in the middle. So we can look left and cross the first segment and then look right and safely cross the second segment. Um, and then we come this last segment of path up towards uh, Indian Rock. So this is the lower side of Indian Rock here. Interesting enough, all, just off the path on each side, there is a, a residence and they do not um, have an entrance directly on the street or, or a driveway uh, to the street. There, there's a couple other paths like this in Berkeley as well that have um, that have houses that are that the only entrance is, is from a public path. So if we go up here and um, go around to the right, we eventually cut in, come to where there's some more steps cut into the rock. 
um, the first step is uh, is really quite a doozer. Uh, maybe it's because the, the earth has subsided since they cut the rocks, but having gotten up to that, uh, we can easily climb to the top. Um, now, Great uh, uh, Indian Rock uh, Park was also donated to the city uh, in 1970 by, uh, by Mason McDuffie as part of their North uh, Bry, Bry development. Um, and when we get up to the top, uh, there's a pretty wide view. Um, there again is uh, San Francisco and the Golden Gate and Marin, and I think this is Angel Island. Um, and so this is this is the most popular rock park for coming to enjoy the view. Um, one does have to be careful at the top because on one side there's a very steep drop off on the if it would be over to the right here from where we're looking out to the west. So it'd be basically on the north side of the rock outcrop. Um, the, uh, the, this rock and some others have some historical significance because Dick Leonard, who was known as the father of technical climbing, David Brower, who's uh, the famous environmentalist who's in silhouette here on the left, um, Jules I Icorn, uh, Bester Robinson, and other members of the Cragmont Climbing Club practiced in the 1930s here and at two other parks we will see. Uh, in just a bit to prepare for climbing the difficult rock faces of Yosemite. Um, and uh, they pioneered uh, dynamic belaying, the use of nylon rope and other innovations transforming the sport. And the outcrops are still popular with climbers to learn and practice both free climbing and technical climbing. If we go around to that north side of the rock outcrop, here we can see uh, a young woman climbing and this particular face she's climbing is, it's more than vertical. <laughs> uh, it's kind of amazing. Well, you can see why they kind of put these pads here because <laughs> if you make a false step, um, you hopefully won't hurt yourself too badly. Uh, but this is a place you often see people uh, climbing. Well, we're gonna go back up to the street um, and uh, which is, well, we're gonna go up to the street, which is beyond on the other side of this rock outcrop, which is Indian rock and Avenue, and we're gonna go a little bit to the right. Um, and uh, at this corner, uh, we have a view of three houses here, which are all designed by uh, John Hudson Thomas. The, the house here is, is actually another house that's behind. Um, these three houses were going downhill, were designed by John Hudson Thomas, the, the architect I mentioned earlier. And at this time he was uh, part of a movement called the Viennese Secession. Um, in Vienna, they believe they were seceding from traditional uh, architecture that they thought was fuddy-duddy and old-fashioned and too much this and that. And so it was, it was one of the early uh, movements of, of modern architecture. Um, and it's kind of interesting the way, although it's going downhill, so it's a little hard to see the effect, but the way the house at each end is vertical and the one in the middle is rather horizontal. So it almost like the other, the two houses bookend the one in the middle. Um, this house on the left was actually for a time John Hudson Thomas's own house. Well, uh, right next to that house is Shattuck Avenue. Now, if you know Berkeley, uh, Shattuck Avenue is this big wide street uh, in at downtown Berkeley where the BART station is. Well, this is the same Shattuck Avenue. When it gets up into the hills here, uh, it gets pretty narrow. Um, and we're gonna go up Shattuck Avenue uh, past the John Hudson Thomas house and we get to a rock outcrop in front of someone's home that has a big wooden sculpture of a bear on it. Of course, the bear is found on the California state flag. And uh, it's also the golden bears are the, are the Cal uh, football team name. Um, but actually um, before the bear, it looked like this. This is the same rock, the same house. Um, it had this huge coastal live oak growing out of the top of the rock, I don't know. I mean, the roots went down somewhere. I, I don't know how <laughs> how it managed to grow there. Uh, and it was it was just very impressive. Unfortunately, a couple of years ago, the tree died. I, I don't know if it was drought or um, the sudden oak death syndrome, uh, but the tree died, so it was removed and replaced uh, with the bear sculpture. Well, we go back on Shattuck Avenue to Indian Rock, and right there, there's some steps, and then a, a, an asphalt path going through the upper section. This is another section of Indian Rock Park that's on the other side of 
Indian Rock Avenue. And there are some more rock outcrops here that are not as high, but they're also popular for, for practicing climbing. Uh, we go through that and we come to Indian Rock Avenue again, which curves uh, and goes uphill to the right. And we go up that and we come to at Oxford Street. Um, sorry, I've got the street, the, I got the house number wrong there. Uh, but at the corner of Indian Rock Avenue and Oxford Street is um, this house. It's also designed by John Hudson Thomas. And it's, he, he often did a mixture. This one is a mixture of craftsmen and other styles. Um, it's, a, it's a very unique looking house and uh, has this, uh, this big uh, sort of patio here. Uh, one of the things that John Hudson Thomas did is he liked to sign his, his uh, designs. And his sign was to use uh, four small squares and vertical lines as seen here uh, on the chimney. And uh, this house is, I believe from, um, I don't have the years, but I, I'm guessing it's around 19 teens. Well, we go just a little past this and we, uh, the sidewalk actually becomes a path that goes through the walk, uh, through the park, a uh, mortar rock park because the, the rock outcrops come down to the street. Um, and we go up some steps and there's a plaque uh, here which tells a bit about the Native Americans who, um, well, we're gonna see something that they did uh, with this rock, but also they used a lot of the plants that are still growing in this little park. Um, this is another one donated by Mason McDuffie to the city. Um, there are uh, things that were edible like the elderberry, the blue elderberries and the, um, the nuts of the bay laurel trees. Um, there were um, things that they used for uh, the, the branches of the blue elderberry trees they used to make instruments, um, other things that they used for, uh, for making bassets, clothing, dyes, and, and medications. If we go past this, uh, the, the trail goes up through the rock outcrop, um, and these are buckeye trees and moss on the rocks, a it, it place that has really a very nice ambiance. Just a little farther along, the path forks, and if we take this right fork, we go back to the main rock outcrop, where there actually, this is one of two sets uh, of uh, mortar holes. The mortar holes were used to grind acorns. They would have another rock, like a pestle, so this is a, like a mortar and pestle, and they would grind the acorns. They had to leach out, use a lot of water to leach out the tannins, uh, but then the acorns became Really, it was a staple food for the Native Americans. Sometimes they could also use the buckeyes when, when needed as a food, although they had to work harder to get the, the toxins out of the buckeyes to make them edible. Um, now, Mortar Rock Park, uh, you can also, you, there's also some steps up at the top, but unfortunately the trees block the view, so it doesn't really have the view that some of the other parks do. Well, as we leave, we, we continue on, we're leaving a few steps down, we're back on Indian Rock Avenue, a sidewalk, and we go up uh, about three blocks on Indian Rock Avenue and we come to Santa Barbara. And at Santa Barbara, we cross Santa Barbara and Indian Rock Avenue to get to Grotto Rock Park. This is number five of our rock parks. Um, and this rock park was again uh, donated by uh, Mason McDuffie. Um, I'm just trying to check here. What was the, uh, I don't know if I put the size in. Um, in any case, it was named Grotto Rock Park because there was uh, at one time a, a little spring uh, that came out of a grotto, but apparently not uh, flowing anymore. Um, there is a, uh, a path uh, with some steps that goes up along one side of the park um, like this. And there is a place where there's some steps cut up in the rock but they don't go all the way to the top. And there's one spot that's a little tricky. And then after that, it's really a rock scramble to get to the top. But obviously some people do it because we saw them sitting on the top. Uh, and, but we can go all the way around the rock outcrop and we might notice along the way, um, all these holes which in the, in the rock, which were formed by uh, some kind of erosion over the years. Um, at the front of the park, um, there's quite a good collection of native plants. There's manzanita and black sage and sagebrush and Fremontodendron with its bright yellow flowers. It's a, a very uh, nice collection of, of native plants. This is just some of them seen in this picture. Well, we're gonna go um, back to the street and we're gonna go left, which is south 
on Santa Barbara to Marin Avenue. And uh, Marin Avenue uh, goes straight up the street. We'll, we'll see a picture of it in a moment, but just to point out of we've come up here, we've gone to Grotter Rock Park, we're gonna go up to Spruce and then we're gonna loop around here is the last part of our walk. If from Santa Barbara looking down Marin, it comes straight up the hill, very steep and straight. Um, and it comes up from the Marin Circle, if you know North Berkeley at all. Um, I mentioned before there was a plan to put the state capital in, in North Berkeley in 1908. It didn't happen, but they'd already laid out the streets. And this street they laid out not to be a street, but to be a cable car route. Um, the cable car never got put in because the capital never came. and. Uh, uh, it's now a, a, a very popular <laughs> route for cars getting to the uh, neighborhoods up in the hills. And then we look, if we look the other way up towards Spruce Avenue, um, that's where we're going to go. We're going to go up one block to Spruce Avenue. And it's, it's actually steeper than it looks in this photograph. From there, from Spruce Avenue, we're going to turn right. Um, let's go back to our map just so you can see where we're going. Okay, we're at Spruce Street. We're going to turn right. And we go a little ways and we come uh, to Easter Way. We go up one block pretty steep on Easter Way to Craigmont Avenue. We continue up another steep block to Euclid. We have to jog left a little bit. And then we come up uh, the last segment of Easter Way, which is not quite so cheap. I I'm so steep, I'm sorry. And we get to this point where we are entering Craigmont Rock Park. Now Craigmont Rock Park, we are actually in a, a different subdivision. We're in a third subdivision now, which was, uh, there was Craigmont and North Craigmont, which is another developer. This park was actually, the land was purchased by the neighbors from the Craigmont Land Company and donated to the city in 1920. And it was later expanded to be a six acre park. So we go up this pathway and we get to the street here, which is Regal Road. And from Regal Road, there's a paved, fairly wide path leading to the upper part of the park, which is a fairly flat area uh, on the top of the rock outcrop. When we get up there, there's a little bit of a rise uh, with this path up leading up to a little pavilion with a picnic table. And um, there is a view from here, depending on whether they've pruned the uh, trees and shrubs or not. From that flat area of the park, there is, however, we can walk over to this low wall and there's a nice view uh, towards Oakland and the South Bay. If we go uh, back down to the lower part of the park and then uh, kind of uh, counterclockwise around the park, there's a, a somewhat uh, partly steep little path that leads to the, the back face of the, uh, the rock outcrop that's very steep. Um, it's higher than the, one, uh, than, than the other ones. And this was another favorite in the 1930s and still is today as a place. And you can see they're, they're using ropes here uh, for, for climbing that face. Um, the path actually, I only discovered that the path went beyond this a couple years ago, and it goes an area where there is a nice uh, slope with grass and oak trees leading down to the backyards of various houses. Um, and you can also look up towards the, that pavilion on the top part of the park, and you could, you could scramble up the rocks here. You can't really go out all the way around because there's a private uh, yard that blocks the way to going all around. So we're going to go back, and we're going to go back up to uh, Regal Road, and we're looking across to what looks like a ruins. Um, it's actually um, just built to be a kind of faux ruins. Um, and it's with this big house, which some years ago when it was for sale, they called it the Villa Tremonto, which means the Sunset Villa. Um, and it's a very big house. It's from 1927. Um, it was uh, originally built um, by a guy named uh, Ansel Hall, um, and it's from 1927. He and his wife built a cottage and then they kept expanding and expanding as their family grew to be six children, including a set of triplets. He was actually the uh, first chief forester for the Net US National Park Service. Um, and a guy named Bill Bodie later renovated the buildings and the gardens. And there, there are actually four separate uh, housing units here. There's the main house here there's another unit over the five car garage. Uh, there's another little unit here. And then back, this is, this is the driveway comes up through this archway to this part here. There's another residential unit here, but I think it may be all under one owner at this point in time. 
Well, from there, we're going to go right uh, down Regal Road. We come to a path called the Pinnacle Path, and just left up that is this mosaic wall. It's made from bits and pieces of ceramics and mirrors and shells and little tiles. Um, it was built a good a number of years ago, dedicated to the mother of the family called uh, Irene's uh, Wall. And um, unfortunately, she, she passed away in 2007, but uh, this is still here as remembrance of her. Further up the farther up the path, there's a gate into the backyard and a bulletin board, and they have various uh, outdoor performances here, I, keeping their social distance, I guess, um, at a place called One Pinnacle Path. That's me. I'm actually going down uh, the path, but we're going up it right now. We get uh, up to Poppy Lane, um, and we go right, and after a short distance, we come to the final uh, rock park, which is called Rem Remillard Park, and the rock is called uh, Pinnacle Rock. Um, this was donated to the city um, in 1963 by Lillian Remillard Dandini in memory of her father, who was, his name, last name was Remillard, who had a major brick making company in the Bay Area that provided bricks for buildings all around the Bay. Um, this park is, uh, is actually six acres. Um, and there's, uh, it, it's another one that's extremely popular with, with hikers. Um, Ken can correct me if I'm wrong later, but um, this rock is actually from deep in the Earth's mantle. It's like something like 140 million years. So think Jurassic period. So this is very different from all the rhyolite in the other rocks. Um, and it's one that's been then pushed up uh, over the millennia or the, the, the eons, I should say. Um, and uh, it's one people, you can also climb it uh, otherwise, but it's also popular for using ropes to climb. Well, it's time to go back. Um, oh, one last thing is there, here's, here's a close up of the rock with its plaque to see a little bit better. It's, it's obviously a more kind of reddish brownish rock compared to the, the rhyolites. There were a little bit of a yellowish gray. So we go back, um, we have two alternatives. We've come around here. We saw Craig Mount Rock Park, Remlard Park. We can go down, uh, for, oh, I'm sorry, we go back Poppy Lane. We pick up Pinnacle Path. This time we go left on Regal. We go right down Craigmont Avenue. We go left on Santa Barbara. Um, then that goes into Spruce. We go Spruce. We have two choices. We could go straight down Marin to the Marin Circle, and then a little bit around to the left, where we go around, pick up Mendocino Avenue, back down Indian uh, Rock Path. Uh, if we don't want to go Marin with all this traffic, we can just go one block down to Santa Barbara. We immediately bear left on Indian Rock. We go back through Mortar Rock Park. We go Indian Rock Park or the other side of the Rock Rock Park and way down to Indian Rock Path. So um, I see we, uh, we, we finished our rock, we got back safely and we didn't even work up a sweat. Um, thank you all very much. Um, I hope if, um, if you're interested, uh, Berkeley Walks can be uh, found in some local bookstores um, where I think, they can, I think they can still sell for you to pick up books. Or uh, if you want to write to Janet and me, info at berkeleywalks.com uh, we'd be happy to sell you a signed copy. Um, any case, um, thank you very much for joining us at Greenbelt today. Oops. Uh, here's, here's our final slide, uh, Greenbelt mission to educate, advocate, and collaborate. So we work with lots of other groups to ensure the Bay Area's lands and communities are resilient to a changing climate. Um, I think we have a little bit of time here for, uh, for questions. Yeah, we do. Um, and I'm going to jump in because we had some throughout the presentation. Uh, the first question that came in was from Stephen Weisenthal, and he asked, when you were presenting on Contra Costa rock steps, who cut the steps in the rocks and when? Um, that's a good question. Um, it seems I don't really know the answer, and maybe I need to do some further research on that. I know they've been there a long time. Um, I'm guessing because if you think about it, the, the parks that were donated by Mason McDuffie as part of North Bry are the ones that have the rock steps. So I'm guessing that they may have done it um, because you don't find them in the ones uh, in Craigmont Rock Park, in Remillard Park, or in um, uh, Great Stoneface Park, which were donated by someone else. So it may have been Mason McDuffie, but I'm not sure. An interesting question. I, I will try and research that and see what we can find. Okay. Um, 
And Linda Franklin asked if you have a link to the maps that you were sharing, if you could include that in the chat. And if you do have a link, I'll also include it in a follow up email, um, which, by the way, a few people were asking about um, if there will be a recording. So sorry, I'm going to interject really quick. Yes. Um, let folks know that, yes, we are recording this. Um, and later today, we will send out an email that has a link to that recording. And in that email, uh, we're also including uh, links to two different surveys. One is for this outing, and the other one is uh, a more general survey around our communications at Greenbelt Alliance. So we would love for you to provide feedback on that. Um, and then of course, lastly, but certainly not least, um, if you enjoyed this outing, be sure to check out our events page on the website to see you know, upcoming outings. And the next one is happening in January. And that will be led by the wonderful Ken Lavin. Um, and he'll take us through the Marin Headlands and Tennessee Valley. So check that stuff out too. Um, um, I could, um, I have JPEGs for these maps and I can send them to Jesse for, to include in that. Uh, the main, the, the one, the overall map is, is, is in the book. That's the style of the map that's in the book. And that's also in the free outings at our website of uh, www.berkeleywalks.com. And I'll include a link to the book, um, on the website where you can access the book as well in that email. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Um, it looks like we have a comment uh, from B uh, who said their 97 year old neighbor said that the steps at Indian Rock were made during the WPA projects following okay. the election. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, the WPA, they also, if you know Berkeley, the Rose Garden, that kind of amphitheater thing with all the roses and all, um, that was a WPA project between WPA and Berkeley in the 1930s. And there's some other WPA stuff in Berkeley. So it's a very important thing from, from, uh, from the 1930s. Yes, that's, that's great to know. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, and next question. Uh, Gary asked, is the developer Mason McDuffie the same as the current mortgage company? Yeah, they were real estate. Well, I don't know if it's a mortgage company, but they were a real estate developer. I think Mason McDuffie, the real estate company, is now part of, it was, it, it's now part of another, uh, another firm. Um, I, I, I don't, I may, perhaps they also had a mortgage company, but Mason McDuffie, uh, Duncan McDuffie was actually a major environmentalist who was friends with uh, John Muir and he was, he helped uh, promote the state, the regional, East Bay region, formation of the Eastern Regional, East Bay Regional Parks and the state park system. Um, and he also developed uh, the Claremont area in Berkeley, as well as uh, Forest Hill in Berkeley, in, in San Francisco. Okay. So that's prob probably the same company, yes. Perfect. And Joan asked, did developers who donated parks to the city of Berkeley get some advantage from the donation? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's possible. I don't know what like tax structure, <laughs> tax laws were like way back in the 19 teens. Um, one thing I think as a practical matter, um, some of the, you know, it's pretty difficult to build when you've got the great big rock outcrop. And in fact, um, you know, like icebergs, there's, uh, there's a good part of rock that's also underground. You know, there's, there's these rock outcrops that come above ground. There's a good, a lot of that rock is, is still underground. Some people theorize that maybe a lot of them are joined up underground, but we don't really know. Uh, but in any case, it would have been difficult to build on some of the sites of, so, well, why not do donate them? Okay, and Alice asked, um, what was the address or street name of the Lu the Luca trees? Sorry, the Luca trees. The, uh, oh, the, um, the paper bark or Melaleuca trees. It's at uh, basically right near the corner of the Alameda and Capistrano Avenue. So if you just go north on the Alameda from Solano, you will get to it. They're also in some other places. There's one that's on street just off of uh, Marin Avenue and some other places around Berkeley and Albany. Okay, and this one, um, this is gonna test your memory, I think, Bob, but <laughs> Barbara asked, in the foreground of the photo showing the three large houses in a row, one horizontal bracketed by two more vertical homes, was there a sculpture in the foreground of this first house? And if so, is it of Bufano? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. 
Um, I'm guessing the, the was the photograph what, was it visible in the photograph I showed you? I don't. Um, I can't remember, but the good news is that in this recording, you'll get access to all these slides again, obviously, because it'll be recorded, and so we can go back and study those slides oh, and check them out. So <laughs> I don't know uh, if there's a sculpture there. One thing I didn't point out earlier is around the neighborhood, there are a number of these things that have a stone column with a sort of sphere on top. These were put in by the developer as a kind of, you know, where, where the, the street names are on, on, on these pillars. Uh, they were put on to further give it, like the urns in South Oaks, they were put it in to, to kind of give a upscale uh, ambiance to it. It's all, it was also done in Craigmont area. There's some more of these. And I think in, uh, and maybe Cra in the Claremont area as well. But I don't, I don't know in the picture here. Uh, I'll have to go back and look and find out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I think that's it. Let's see. Yeah, that's it for questions. Um, Barbara Atwell did share a comment that a great example of paper bark trees is on Jefferson Street south of university near oh, McGee. yes yes on jefferson street yes that's another great example um it's almost like a whole block i think it's almost like a block and a half of them um and they're they're just i can't tell you exactly when but sometime around june or so they're they're really amazing with the uh, with the white flowers on top and they they keep those they they look like linari foliage it means like you know the foliage is like little little lines because they're very thin so they almost like like coniferous but but they're not, and they're and they're also they're not deciduous. Um, they keep the uh, foliage all year. Okay. Ken, did you have anything to say on what I said about the geology? Did it, did you have any? Yeah, that was close enough for okay. government business. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. And uh, just to to jump in, Nancy did say that she she actually lives across the street. Um, from those houses in question, and there is not a sculpture there. So. Oh, okay. There okay. Maybe there was at some time. I don't know. <laughs> All righty. Uh, well, that that ends our our session today. And as I said before, I encourage you to join us for our next one in January. Um, thank you so much, Bob. What an interesting presentation. All right. Thank you very much for joining us today. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Take thank care. You. All right. Take care. Stay well. <laughs>